I fell in love with this topic. So it's so funny that you would ask me this because I did my capstone on um, the misrepresentation of African-American men in the community, um, in society, not even community, in society. Listen, it's the message right here. Black boy, tell me how you really feel. Cause I just want to build with you. Black girl, tell me how you really feel. I want to keep it real with you. I want to live better, eat better. I want to love better, sleep better. Yeah, I want to feel so aligned. Sublime. You know, the work that I do is primarily uh, with adults and it's with um, communication, specifically for black people. Um, and some of what I've been talking about is how our childhoods affect our ability to communicate, our ability to empathize, our ability to um, change even. So, you know, there was something I saw that said like 92% of who we become as an adult is dictated between the ages of zero and seven. So the question I have for you as somebody who works with kids, black kids specifically in that age range, how true is that? Oh gosh, that is, I don't want to say a hundred percent because you know nothing's hundred percent. Um, you have the whole nature versus nurture debate and all that good stuff, but I would say at least, at least 90%, um, only because the developmental stages, um, during that time, you know, you're going through the oral stage, the anal stage, and those are really, really important stages because that's when, you know, the children, they're depending on their parents for everything, you know? Um, and if, they miss one of those needs on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You know, you don't, you're not getting that support. You're not getting the loving, the nurturing, you know, the um, just being comfort, comfortable and knowing that if I'm hungry, my parents are going to feed me. If I'm upset about something, they're going to, you know, provide their comfort. They're going to reassure me. If you miss that during that time, you know, as adults, the way that you react to, um, even if it's just, you know, someone giving you that constructive criticism, you're going to take it a completely different way or you may become more fixated on things. And specifically for African-Americans, you know, we're already marginalized in society as it is, you know. So when we're not given what we need at home and from society, that kind of stunts where the child is at. And so as your, yes, your age increases, but, you know, your emotional ability to handle and to process things, it stays at that point. And let's not even get started on if your family has, you know, some mental diagnosis, you know, there are certain ones that are strictly genetic. So, and you have your, your time, I think it's 18 or 21. Um, but if you have, you know, if it's schizophrenic or um, bipolar disorders, those will manifest at those ages. Um, so when you don't, when you haven't gotten all of the assistance that you need or gotten that love from your family or, um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be bio family members, you know, it can be, um, we call them kinship family members. So friend of the family, um, a church member, you know, either a teacher, if you don't get that extra loving from them um, as you're growing up and you're going through these different developmental stages and you're trying to find your independence and things of that nature, it definitely, definitely can cause an issue. And I have seen that in a lot of our kids. Um, and if you don't get the help, the therapy that you need, then you're just going to keep going back to, well, you know, my mom never did this or, you know, my mom would yell at me whenever I did such and such. And so now that's how I respond. So people don't understand that if you don't, even if you feel like your childhood was great, there are still certain elements that, you know, you may have missed. Um, and if you don't work through those as an adult, it will definitely cause issues, you know, not only internally, but in your relationships with others and, you know, on jobs in your professional lives as well. So. so as somebody who works in this profession, are there some, I guess, nuggets of wisdom that you have learned um, and that you can pass on to others on how to interact with, deal with, help heal mm -hmm. or not even help heal, but... Um, empathize with, provide space for a partner, for instance, who has a less than ideal childhood. Mm. 
Oh gosh. Um, <sighs> and especially guess... a black party. Black <laughs> yes. party. I just want to put that out there. Yes. Black party. yes. Oh my gosh. Um, I guess the main thing that I have realized and I feel like has helped me is you got to put your bias aside when you're working with other people, um, regardless of the age. And for me, because I am so involved with, you know, the kids that I work with, so I'm always doing clinical staffings and I feel like for me, I, I, and I can't generalize it for social workers, but for me as a social worker, my mind is always, before I say something, I'm always like, okay, if someone is, let's say you're going through a crisis right now, you're you're reacting one way and I wouldn't react that way. I have to think about my words before I say them. I don't want to just say, oh, that's how, you know, that's that's not how you should be reacting. Let's let's take a step back and think about it, because not everybody when they're they're up here, you know, some people want you to be up there with them. That's how they respond. And then some people, you know, you come at them from this level and it brings them down as well. So just putting aside your, your own bias when you're talking to people um, and when you're working with them and just realizing that the way my thinking as a social worker is not going to be your thinking. And I had a bad habit initially um, in relationships of assuming <laughs> that we, yes mm. yes assuming that you know because i'm going through these processes uh whether it be you know biopsychosocial or just breaking it down to just the the psychological issues you're not doing that and you can't just assume that they are you know and you can't just assume that they're understanding where you're coming from um because they don't and when it comes to like, actually being in the field of social work you have to think about the person first. Um, you know, social work is a vast field and you can do so much with it from, you know, being working at the Department of Social Services to, you know, being in a hospital, being in the schools as a counselor, you know, as a therapist, um, as a school social worker. But it's not your behaviors are not just subjected to that one okay, I'm a social worker, so that means I have to give them all the resources. It's not always going to happen like that. You know, you can give them resources. That doesn't mean that they're going to use it. So just keep it in mind that you're here for the client or, you know, certain settings they don't like for you to call them clients. But overall, you're here for the client and you can't project what you want them to do onto them because they may not be ready for that. They may not be at that stage of, okay, you know, you were just in pre-contemplation yesterday where you're like, I know what I need to do. And now you're actually putting the action in. It doesn't always happen like that. Um, so just realizing that you're here for them and the same goes for relationships. You know, I am here for you where you need me to be and what you need me to be. Um, as long as it's not damaging to both of us, then I will keep showing up like you need me to show up. So I think that's, that's what I've learned. Um, even though I've only been in this field, this is my fifth year. Um, but I feel like my initial position was so just, raw <laughs> to the point where when I started my first day I was they were like oh you've only been out of college for a year this is what you chose to do with your first job out of college and I was like should I be concerned but yeah you know yeah um but you do learn a lot and you get exposed to a lot in this profession so, so something that comes up a lot <clears throat> during some of the conversations that I have is that Black men don't properly empathize with the struggles of black women. Uh, black women don't properly empathize with the struggles of black men. So as a black woman who works in social work, who works around children, specifically black boys who've been traumatized, what have you learned about black men? Oh, wow. Um, their voices are not heard enough. Um, that's, that's the biggest thing. Um, and... I, I, 
I fell in love with this topic, so it's so funny that you would ask me this because I did my capstone on um, the misrepresentation of African American men in the community, um, in society, not even community, in society. But I had to, of course, narrow it back down, so I narrowed it um, to the PD region. But um, I don't know how. I guess as I got more into social work. Um, and I just, I will read the, our DSM-5 that has all of our diagnosis in it, um, symptoms and all of that. I will just read that just so that I can get more information because it's really interesting to me. So as I was learning more about different diagnoses um, and how they can manifest themselves, I started thinking back to men in my family or, you know, my male friends. And I realized that there are a lot of they may not be able to be diagnosed. It may be unspecified, but there are subtle hints of, you know, PTSD among mm. black men. And, you know, even some men, um, I had a friend and he was schizophrenic. Um, all the symptoms were that he knew something wasn't right, but, you know, he was going to the psychologist and the psychiatrist and they would not prescribe him anything. And I just realized like, and then just seeing on social media how, you know, it was, I can't remember what month it was, but it was like every post that I scrolled past was a, a black man saying that they were going through a lot, but they didn't feel like they could talk about it. That, or, you know, I'm telling, you know, people that I'm feeling this way and they're like, oh, just suck it up, you know, because that's what, as boys, they're told, oh, you're crying, you hurt, suck it up, you know, just move on. Stop acting like a little girl, you'll be all right. So I have seen that. Black men really cannot express how they're feeling. You know, they can't have these mental check-ins or these emotional check-ins. Um, and sadly, it's even when they're in relationships with people that, you know, they don't feel comfortable telling them how they feel because, you know, the person is just like, oh, you're a man. You're supposed to be strong. You know, you're you're not supposed to feel anything, you know, but. Do they get that from women, too? Mm -hmm. Really? OK. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I feel like for for women, um, the stigma around what well, it goes for men, like women and men, the stigma around mental health. Um, and I did, I did a paper on that as well. And I interviewed, you know, a few people and everyone, they were in different regions, but they all pretty much said the same thing that because, you know, if you say that, you know, you're feeling this kind of way um, or if you get like the official diagnosis, you don't want that label slapped on you. And because then you feel like you become, you're just bipolar. Or, you know, you're just, um, you just have even ADHD, which is so crazy to me. Like, you know, just as a black person being, oh, you know, yeah, you may have ADHD. Then it's, okay, now everybody's looking at me crazy. Or them just feeling like people are looking at them and judging them. Or um, if you react a certain way, um, you know, like if you have a manic episode where you're just, you're out buying a lot of things or, you know, more commonly known people when they think about manic episodes, you know, when it comes to bipolar, they think about people throwing things all over the place, but that's not always the case or borderline. If you just express, you know, any instance of a heightened emotion, if you are, if you've made it known to people that, you know, you have this um, mental illness, then they're automatically, oh, it's because of her bipolar. It's because of this, you know, it's because of that. And that was the deterring factor for a lot of the African-American men and women that I talked to as to why they didn't feel comfortable, you know, um, speaking on anything that was bothering them in their relationships or um, just to mental health professionals at all, because they didn't want to be viewed differently. Um, and they didn't want to basically feel like their value as a person to their significant other went down as well, which was just so sad to me. Because you should feel safe with the person that you're with. Like, um, get a little personal here. But I, um, last year, it was just a lot with school. Um, I had just stepped into my new program director position, um, working as a full-time intern as well. And I wasn't just doing 
like, oh, I'm just show up as my, you know, at my internship. I was looking for groups to do with the girls. Some were autistic, some were borderline, you know, had borderline personality disorder. Um, some just had, they were like unspecified disorders as well. So I was actually putting in that extra work to find groups for them because I wanted them to feel like they were seen, you know, to feel like they had that support. But at the same time, I was battling depression and anxiety and I was smiling on the outside, but it took so much to get up just to go to work, um, just to, you know, go there to the group home with them. Um, I just cut out my whole gym routine. I had been going, you know, Monday through Friday and I just didn't feel like it. And on certain days I would just be sad and I just didn't want to talk. I, I didn't want to be bothered, but in my position, I had to. So I was just pushing through it and it wasn't until I had a really really bad panic attack um and I said you know what I need I need a therapist I need to find you know I need to find a therapist and now in my current relationship you know I I feel comfortable talking to him about you know okay this is I feel like this is going to be a bad day for me I, it was really hard for me to get out of the bed and I just, I know my triggers and he's taking the time to learn my triggers as well. And knowing, okay, you know, if the weather is this way, let me see what I can do to try to, you know, get her perked up so that this is not a bad day for her. Um, so I just really appreciate that. And he's in turn, you know, becoming more open to me because I'm showing up that way to him. So, you know, a lot of times when you show up one way to someone, not all the time, but because, you know, humans, we mirror each other, they're going to show up to you in that same way. So I just think that that's great. And I wish that more African-American men and women felt that comfort in their relationships.